But then a question arises. If trade balances are persistent, how is it possible for them to be brought about? How is it possible for them to be sustained? And here you come to the second part of the argument, which is in Marx and Harrod, and to some extent in Keynes, which is to say, look, that whole quantity theory stuff that Ricardo is wrong. I mean, Keynes is obviously not a Friedmanite either, so you can see why he wouldn't argue this. But think of the counter-argument. And this is the argument actually made in Marx, but alas, as far as I can tell, only in a single sentence that uh, I found. And there may be you know, 10 manuscripts somewhere sitting in, in the archives that have never been published. But here's the argument. We start from the Ricardian story. And Marx is commenting here on Ricardo's story. <clears throat> and he says, the Ricardian story tells us that if the country A is running a trade surplus, commodities will be flowing net into country B which means that country B is going to be putting money into country A. And Marx says that's correct. But then he says, Ricardo has, brings out this old humbug that when money flows into a country, prices rise. And Marx says this is obviously false. What happens is when money flows into a country, liquidity increases. There's a lot more money looking for uses. And the interest rate falls. You can put it another way, the price of bonds rises. Not the price of commodities, but the price of bonds. Or the interest rate falls. So the country with the trade surplus will have a lot of liquidity and therefore have, in a, in a competitive market, a lower interest rate. A country with a trade deficit will have a shortage of liquidity and a high interest rate. Now consider the implication. If there's a low interest rate in a country that has lots of liquidity, then capitalists are going to borrow the money there and lend it where the interest rate is high. It doesn't even have to be from their own country. I mean, it's arbitrage. If I can find an interest rate that's low here and a, one that's high here, I will borrow in the low interest rate and lend in the high. And the effect of that will be equalize the interest rates. But in the end, that will come about only if the effect is money not flowing the other way. In other words, if the balance of payments is zero. So what are we getting? A trade surplus in China, money flowing out to count as a result of the trade surplus, looking for higher rate of return. US trade deficit, money flowing in because interest rates are high and therefore it attracts financial capital in. So China becomes trade surplus capital exporter, the US becomes trade deficit capital importer. Now, Marx actually says this in a phrase. He says that it's nonsense. The interest rates will be the one to do the adjusting. It's Harrod who makes the argument in the second edition of his book on international trade, where he uh, moves away from comparative cost theory to this argument that the effect will be that trade deficits and surpluses will be covered by countervailing capital flows. All through the operations of the free market, not because the state does this, but because the market does it. And then Harrod says, well, of course, states in anticipation of this may encourage it. If they have a lot of liquidity in China, the state may encourage a movement of that or even take charge of the movement of that to the US. But in doing that, it's doing what the market would do. So it's not just that the Chinese state buys US bonds, Chinese uh, capital buys US bonds also. Mm -hmm. As usual, we don't know if Marx ever followed up on the argument because it's just literally uh, a statement of one paragraph in Marx about what happens when there's money coming into a country. First, that comparative costs are determined by relative real wages and relative productivities and by the effects of tradable, non-tradable goods. So real, real exchange rates and also relative costs can be expressed this way. Second, uh, the direction of a country's trade balance is determined by its absolute cost advantage which is not uh, sufficiently affected by trade flows to be easily overturned. That's a simple proposition. China is much cheaper, more efficient. It's going to have a trade surplus from competition, from free market competition. Third, that trade imbalance will be covered by capital flows in the opposite direction. So balance of payments will be balanced, but not balance of trade. The end result will be countries with absolute cost advantages will be able to export their surpluses as foreign loans, and countries with absolute cost disadvantages will have to cover their trade deficits through foreign borrowing. In other words, some the, the successful countries in trade will become capital exporters, lenders, and the unsuccessful countries in international trade will become debtors. Now, anyone who's read anything about the history of development knows that this is the most common outcome. Countries that run deficits have to borrow to cover their deficits. And it's not because of the absence of competition, it is because of the result of competition.